Hello everyone and welcome to Callie's Corner on Unfiltered Gamer. I'm Callie and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at a whole bunch of board game components and supplies that I use to design prototypes of board games and to teach game design to students. So I'll be looking at some broad categories of different components and supplies, as well as sharing some specific items that I've used, as well as links to those items in the description below. So if you'd like to click those links, some of them will be affiliate links. Thank you for supporting Unfiltered Gamer and helping us give away games. If you want to join those giveaways, we give away games on unfilteredgamer.com, as well as every Wednesday night at 6.30 PST on our live streams. You can check that out on Facebook or Twitch. All right, let's get started. First, I'm going to start with the board or tiles because this often is going to be one of the first things you're creating when designing a board game. It may be the focal or point of your game or the main mechanic, unless you're, you're doing a card game. But I like to show these coasters first. These are from Amazon and they're a little bit big for actual tile laying games, but I actually use these as the very, very first uh, board prototypes on a very small scale because I like to use that to just do a self testing prototype first and just that's just to check to see if the mechanic works the way I think it's going to be. It's really easy to draw on these directly with markers and use small wooden tokens or small meeples on these and once you're done using these you can actually just use them as regular coasters to put your drinks on. So it's really a way to recycle them as well. Next, I'll go and create a bigger board and you can do this using Bristol, like a cardstock board. I like Bristol as my cardstock of choice or what I've done as well is actually paint over or paste over uh, other boards from games that have just kind of deteriorated and we're ready to throw out or prototype pieces that we've, we've gotten from other games and actually then just draw on the board that way, create your own board as well. For actual tile pieces, there's a few different options. I picked up these hexagon tiles from Amazon. I'll link these ones as well. And you can see how they kind of fit together. They're a larger size, which is fun. In addition, Game Crafter has some small square tiles, which are, these are two inch by two inch, and I think they have some smaller ones as well. I think this is the slightly larger tiles that could fit. They're pretty thick cardboard, uh, definitely easier than any cardboard you would cut yourself. Uh, Amazon also has wooden tokens that are a lot smaller, and I've used these for uh, some of the tokens in, in my game Moonshell, actually using sticker paper to print and then cut out different icons for the tiles. It made it really easy to create a bunch of different prototypes. Next up are cards. A lot of games use cards. In fact, some games you might design just use cards and nothing else. You can find these blank playing cards on Amazon. I'll link those below. And what's great about these is you can just draw directly on them with pen or marker and start playing and testing right away. So I have bigger and different sizes. So this is a bigger size. And then the ones we don't have are the square sizes and they also have a hex size, which was like the hexagon tile, but in a paper card format. And these are pretty thick. They're fine for, for prototypes. But if you're really getting into a lot of plays, doing a lot of play testing over and over again at the same time, I definitely recommend getting some sleeves and actually sleeving the cards. And what you can do as well, if you don't want to get the blank playing cards, is you can just write or print out your cards on regular paper and then use, uh, use a poker card or a magic card behind that paper card to give it a little bit of extra thickness and durability. And you can play with the cards just like that. And when in between play tests or right after your play test, you want to edit the card, you just take it out, make your edit, put it back in and you're ready for another play test. That makes it really handy as well. You can get different colored sleeves 
for the backs. So if you have multiple decks in your game, you can quickly identify those different decks. That makes it a lot easier for setting up and even playing and playtesting the game. And next up, we have one of the most iconic components in board games, and that is dice. So there are so many different types of shapes and sizes and colors of dice. You can see we have a lot of dice. In fact, I just use these over here as decor, my little rainbow dice. Uh, and in here we have a whole bunch of different sizes and, and uh, faces and colors of die. So I recommend looking for a variety of dice just to have them on hand. That's great. As well as there's dice that actually don't have any faces on them and you can add your own using sticker paper which is <laughs> my favorite as you'll know by now and uh, you can think about the die in different different ways and how you want to use it in your game as far as you don't necessarily have to stick to the one through six six sided die or even Sequ any sequential numbers, you know, 1 through 8, 1 through 10, 1 through 12. You could be using, this one has some regular blank faces, you can have multiple faces that are the same. You could have different icons on the die as well, not just numbers. Uh, there's a ton of cool things you can do with die, rolling them, manipulating them with cards, and just a lot of fun mechanics that you can use with die. And they add, they can add that and random element to game helping you randomly generate numbers as well as offer ways to mitigate those numbers and not make it quite so random there's there's kind of you can kind of scale it in that way which is great so here's some of the different die here's one that has a lot of different faces i think 30 uh, this one has a bunch of numbers on the different die that are not normal <laughs> there's eight sided die this is a three sided die is pretty cool um, and another blank die that you could just add stickers or something to and make it your own all right next we have wooden cubes and circles we keep a lot of these handy you can see we have quite a few and in different sizes and colors and that's because some games you can actually use a lot of cubes are cubes for a lot of different things and a lot of games they're used for resources or for noting actions or specific spaces on the board or player boards uh, keeping track of of different elements and i'll show you a couple of the sizes specifically here this small size you can find on the game crafter here and it's about 10 centimeters millimeters and this one about 12 millimeters on the game crafter as well the smallest one i could find on amazon is this one it is 15 millimeters so it's definitely um larger than the other sizes so i definitely recommend getting some from the game crafter if you really want uh the small sizes that you normally see in board games another thing to note about the amazon one which i'll link below is that these uh, come unfinished, so you have to paint them and even sometimes uh, sandpaper them a little bit, but you get to choose the exact colors you want. That doesn't mean you couldn't, you could also paint the ones from the Game Crafter if you want slightly different colors. Uh, they have a lot of different colors on the site, so there's a lot of different options there. In a similar vein, we have circle cubes. So these are wooden tokens as well. A lot of times they are used to track points or to track certain numbers on a board or tracker kind of scale. I have a couple here. The smaller one is the 10 millimeter and this one is 16 millimeters and you can find these on the Game Crafters in a bunch of colors. Uh, these are nice as well just to add a little variety from the cubes as well cubes are more like commonly used as resources and and that sort of nature and collecting things where these are more commonly used as trackers but that doesn't mean you couldn't could mix it up and uh, try something new before we get into my favorite section on meeples and other custom wooden tokens, I just want to mention if you're having as much fun as I am, if you found you've been building your own wish list now of things you want to get, please give this video a like and consider subscribing. I really appreciate it. I love seeing the likes and the comments and the support from the community, hearing what you guys want to hear about. It, it really helped me uh, continue making these videos. 
Here we have part of my collection of the rest of our wooden tokens, which includes meeples. So this is the, the more commonly sized meeples here and some small meeples as well. And there's a ton of different custom wooden items you can get as well. So here we have some houses and some sailboats. Um, meeples are great. They're commonly known in the board game industry to indicate a people, a person, or a worker in a worker placement game, or in a game where you're taking over territory, placing those meeples to denote that you own that territory, that area. And they also add a little bit of element of theme to your game, even in that playtesting stage when you're likely not going to have a lot of theme to your game because you're not going to have artwork yet, or a lot of world building. So the the components that you choose for that can really help bring out, oh, okay, I get it. This is part of my army, or this is, these are my farmers, and really help that connection to the theme when you don't have a lot of art yet. In addition, meeples are a better, a way to sort of distinguish between different wooden tokens. If you're using a lot of tokens in your game, if you have a lot of resources, you have a lot of those uh, circle wooden tokens, meeples can be a way to differentiate those in, in just an easier to identify way. You can find meeples and other wooden tokens on the Game Crafter, as well as plastic tokens. So here I have some plastic gem tokens and I just like these, they're very pretty. Uh, it's a way to add variety to uh, resources in a game. It's just kind of fun and as well, it, it matches the theme of your game. The components are an easy way to, common components like this are an easy way to share that theme without yet having the artwork. So the plastic gems, they're sparkly, they're fun, they're a little bit different resource type. They kind of have a magical, mystical element to them. If that's a part of the theme of your game, it's an easy way to evoke that for your playtesters without having a fully fleshed out prototype yet. I also like to have some standees on hand. And these are little plastic pieces that come a variety of shapes and sizes. And what these do is allow you to put a piece of cardboard and stand it directly up to represent a character or down the line. If you want to add miniatures to your game, a standee is going to be a good uh, sort of stand in <laughs> for your miniature while you're prototyping and play testing. And these will hold usually a regular cardboard piece in between the little two plastic pieces here, but you could also double up or even triple up on cardstock to get the same effect. You just want to glue them together securely. The benefit of that as well is that you can print on the front side on one piece of paper and the back side on another, and you don't have to make sure that they line up exactly because you can cut them to make sure they line up exactly. You can find these on the Game Crafter as well in a bunch of different sizes. Well, that was most of the board game specific components that I like to have on hand. And now I'll be talking about some of the more general crafting supplies I like to have around as I'm designing board games. First up is your sketchbook. The sketchbook is so important as a game designer. I like to have a place to sketch out ideas, write my ideas, uh, just visualize what I'm thinking and put it down on paper before I forget about it. So I have a big one of my old sketchbooks here that I like to put ideas in. I have a smaller one as well that kind of is a little bit more portable. Uh, you can use whatever works for you, a blank one, something with grids. I like the grid lines as well. You can get some really nice squares and kind of if you're doing any kind of mathematical work it's a lot easier to see how big pieces are going to be as you're sketching them out i also like to have some sketching pencils on hand you don't have to have specific fancy sketching pencils uh, regular pens or pencils will work as well i like the pencils because they add a little bit of variety to what you're doing so one thing, if you do want to get some sketching pencils, you want to know is the H means hardness and you'll get sharper lines and it's going to be a little bit finer tip. Whereas the B means uh, that it's going to be softer. You're going to get more of a charcoal feel, a little bit flowier and softer lines. Here I've also got my cardstock pad of Bristol board, which I like to use 
for a lot of prototyping and I'll use it with my cutting mat and an exacto knife. And I like to use the cutting mat because it's gonna give you a more precise uh, cut than just using scissors, especially when you're working with thicker materials such as the crystal board or cardboard. It's gonna be a lot easier to cut the cardboard with the X-Acto knife than with scissors. You'll also want a ruler or T-square or even a triangle to help you guide the X-Acto knife and get those 90 degree cuts. It doesn't have to be perfect when you're prototyping, but it is nice to have uh, exact measurements when you're working with multiple components and to help you down the line with the actual, uh, as you're actually figuring out the manufacturing for the game. There's a lot of other crafting supplies you may already have around your household, including pens like Sharpies and markers, plastic baggies, rubber bands. Another thing to really look out for is a good box. So I searched a lot of different places for boxes. This was the best one I could find that is a sort of unmarked box. It is the white frame box from Michaels. It's 10 inches by 12 inches by two inches. And it's just really easy, uh, very plain box, very thick and durable. It's helped me carry around prototypes when I was traveling across the country, which is great. You wanna keep them safe. It also just, looks a lot more professional when you have your prototype in a box as compared to in a baggie or just scattered about in your bag. It just, I don't know why, but for some reason, just putting the items in a box makes it, just takes it to that next level and makes you feel a lot more professional and confident about sharing your game. One more thing I'd like to reiterate is that at the beginning of the prototyping and designing process, it is not important at all to make your game look really good. The main thing is to test, get a minimum viable product so that you can test and see if your mechanic works, if it has some elements of fun, if other people are gonna be engaged with it, and then start sharing it out with other people and see what they say. If the mechanic itself is engaging and fun, then adding those other elements, the art, the story, uh, additional things, it's just going to add to the game and take it to the next level. But in order to stand out in the crowd of so many different Kickstarters and indie game publishers coming on board, you really have to have that stable and really engaging game experience first and foremost before you spend too much time thinking about the art and direction. Speaking of playtesting, I did want to bring up the Fail Faster playtesting journal. It is a nice addition to your own notebook. It doesn't replace a notebook in my opinion, but it can give you some good structure for how to do playtesting and how to track your playtesting over time and see how the changes you make in your game affect the outcomes of the game, how players are feeling. It gives a lot of good information throughout the, the journal. It actually has different questions throughout it, so it, it varies up the game while still giving you a, a baseline measure and seeing how your game has evolved over time, which is great. All right, that's it for this big video on board game components and supplies you can use for prototyping and designing your own board games. I hope you learned a lot or whether you're wanting to design your own games or just get some more insight into the game design process. Please, if you like this video, you you're watching it at the end, so I hope you liked it. Please like it and subscribe. Hit that notification bell and you'll get notified when we have new videos. It really helps the algorithm show you our videos and uh, leave a comment as well. I love to hear the comments as I mentioned. It really it keeps me going and it's really a great motivator. Keep creating videos. You can check us out at unfilteredgamer.com for all of our different content. We have a lot more going up on the website soon. I'm so excited. And if you wanna support us as well, we have our Patreon. I'll link that in the description below. Or if you wanna check out my game that I'm designing, it is Moonshell, a mermaid game, and you can check it out at moonshellgame.com. Well, I'm Callie, that's it, and I look forward to See you guys next time.